Uh, here we are. Back again. Wish me luck. That's a sign of light. They killed two of you guys at quick. Goody's sticking under cover. Your Goody. Your Goody. But mostly the improvise. Of course, it said no words because it didn't form the cosmos. But as you listen, you were about to make up words to correspond to us within the melody. Sometimes they came from the past. Sikiri, Sikiri, Sikiri. Then the singer would stop and say very deliberately, He is first. He is first. Lenny was so determined to make sure that he wanted to stop every time. But Esther wouldn't have that. They're all in their hangar. Mr. Harper had come to Curtin Reside and had laid out the next day's work that he must quit and go with the other young people for ten seconds and for what he now learned to call them instead of Adam. Five days and we keep the work, mornings and evenings. And on Saturdays there would be a place for a single place. I don't know who this is. He had so many cousins all agrees that he wouldn't have to go out of the family for company and diversion. They were an astonishing lot of people, these guys. The earlier generations had married young, and the women had accepted all the children the Lord had sent them for sometimes twenty, and then the women would die off, and then they would start again. In these modern days, of course, everything was changed. One or two children was the rule, and a woman like Esther, who had been, felt that she had gone out of her way to serve the community. But still there were a great many bugs, and others would bud for their first born middle name. Grandfather Samuel had six daughters and four sons living. Samuel's oldest brother, a farmer, was still thriving at the age of 80, and had had 17 children, most of them still alive, preaching and practicing the word of the Lord their God, that their days might be long in the language the Lord their God had given them. Most of those who were not preaching the word were employed by bug gunmakers for operation in one capacity and or get another, and just now were working yeah, the task of making the days of the Germans as short as possible. The Germans had their own God, who was working just as hard for a site as a land in a German magazine which the kind Mr. Robin took the trouble to send him. How these gods adjusted matters up in their heaven was a problem which was too much for him, so he put his mind over the days of ancient Greek and Roman wars. I, I, I. On Sunday morning, the Ernest student would dress himself in a freshly dressed palm beach suit and Panama hat, and at five minutes before 10 o'clock, he would be one of those who followed into the first congregational church. This building occupied a high level position on the central square of New Castle. That's a relief. Two story structure. I mean, it's, I'm dead already. It's really fun to know. I need like, oh, there goes my shield. Oh, great. Oh, 
the next Bible class was one of the features of Newcastle life. It is not in every town that you can be the leading captain of industry based in the class. I'm asking a question. So many took advantage one of this opportunity. The class was held in the main of the church. Many of the leading business men attended. Most of the young executives were and young, and everyone okay. who hoped ever to be an executive. It was Somebody a business as well as a cultural event. Thank you. Did the teacher of this remarkable class have any simple right. ideas as to what caused so many hardworking citizens of his town to give up their golf and tennis and listen to the Italian and English morality and Swiss and Scottish theology? Doubtless he did, but his faith in his Lord and Master did not extend to the two many children of his father and mother. It was enough for Saint Lord that they came. Having them at his mercy for one hour, he pounded the sacred message into them. If they did not take their chance, it was because the Lord had predestined them to everlasting damnation, for reasons which were satisfactory to him and to which no mortal had any business trying to buy. If they chose to sit with blank faces and occupy their minds with how to get a raise in salary, or how to get their wives invited to their butt homes, or what make of the car they were going to purchase, it also had been arranged by an inscrutable divine yeah, providence. Really and all that had been of the ceremony was to quote the text which the Lord had provided, together so, with such yeah. interpretations as the Holy Spirit saw fit to reveal to him at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. I.V. The regular service followed the men's Bible class which meant that the ladies had an extra hour in which to curl their hair and set on top of it their delicate confections of straw and artificial flowers. The war hadn't changed the fashions, nor the fact that there were fashions. All that elegance which had fled from Paris and London was now in Newcastle. The chauffeurs drove back to the homes for the ladies, and they entered with primness and piety, but now and then a sidelong glance to be sure that gentlemen standing in the sunshine on the steps were properly attentive. That little heathen, Lena Bunn, had never attended a church service before, except for a wedding or a funeral. But he did not reveal that fact. The rule was the same as for a dinner party, watch your hostess and do what she does. He stood up and sang a hymn, from a book which Esther put in his hand, the number of the hymn having been announced twice by the minister. Then he bowed his head and closed his eyes while the Reverend Minister sat in back reading. He knows, oh okay. Lord, so was we got 591,926. Which which also, he asked the Lord to do many things so for the congregation, and it seemed to Lanny that the Lord must know about these already. A well trained choir sang a Florida elaborate anthem, this being Newcastle's substitute for Grand Opera. A collection was taken up, and Grandfather Bud passed to take one of the richest pew holders up front, and kept an eagle eye upon the bills which they draw him. Level, Finally, Mr. Saddleback preached a sermon. Lenny had hoped that he would explain See, some of the strongest ones are the gold ones. But instead, he explained the will of the Lord with regard to Kaiser Reno and his own work. Are and he shared the love of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require so the So we got a panther. Whoso shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Have a lance. Nine. Behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you. The Reverend Mister, Saddleback turned his pulpit into a Sinai, and thundered such awful words, and they seemed a direct message to Bud Gunwriker's Corporation, which in the spring of that year 1917 had enlisted all its lathes and grinding machines, these jigs and dies and other schools, in the aligned services of the United States government and the Lord God Almighty. V. Can I do what? Lenny took time off to write letters home and tell his mother and Marcel how things went away. You, you want to get the to Zephyr? Yeah. The Zephyr. You sent an affectionate reply. Get it! 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 Oh, the game is undergoing server maintenance. Members of the new aristocracy would say to their complacent sons, "If you don't buck up and work, I'll send you to Harvard to compete with the Jews." Lenny wrote into the bottles, knowing that it would make them chirp. The salesman of electrical apparatus in Rotterdam forwarded another of Lenny's letters to Kurt, a very careful one, in which Lenny told all about his studies, but didn't mention the USA. He just said, "I've gone to visit my father's home." Right me there. Kurt knew about Newcastle, and in due course, a letter came, a way of Switzerland, as usual. Kurt said that he was well and had gone back to his duties and was glad to hear that his friend was keeping his mind on matters of permanent interest and benefit. That was all. But Lanny could read between those lines and understand that even though Kurt was now fighting America, he didn't want Lanny to be fighting Germany. Midsummer. And Nina wrote again. Rick had had a week's leave and had come home. She had been to the reaches with Hyman. Oh, so happy they had been. So happy they might be all their lives, if only this cruel slaughter would end. The Baron and his wife had been kind to her, and Rick was a darling he had voted and bathed and played Change with him. Change the map to the heavenly nights, with music on the river, and starlight trembling on the water, and loving their hearts. There it is. They all came over land in a wave of melancholy longing. 
check out the scan and now it was New England's turn. Scans. There's P. 18 scans. Perhaps the letter from Nina and Lanny's continual thinking about it may have had something to do with the strange experience which befell him a few nights later. When Lanny went to bed, he was tired in both mind and body and usually fell asleep at once and rarely wakened until the maid tapped on his door. But now something roused him. At least, he insisted that he was awake, fully awake, and no amount of questioning by others could shake his surface. He lay there, and it seemed that the first faint gray of dawn was stealing into the room just in its light so that you could know it was a room, and that there were objects in battle. The mockingbird had noticed the light, and the crickets had gone to sleep, and the stillness caught Lanny's attention. Yeah. It seemed abnormal. Remember you got a... Then a weird feeling began to steal over him. Okay, you won't. Something was happening. Hold he didn't know what it was. The fear of it being disturbed in his soul, got a, and his skin yeah. began to create the water. So it seemed. Lanny stayed out of the darkness, and it appeared to be taking form, and he began to wonder whether the light was the light or something else. It seems to be shaping itself into a mess at the foot of his bed, and the mouse began to move, and suddenly Lanny realized it was Rick. A pale gray figure, just luminous enough so that it could be clearly seen. The game is flying to all stained with mud. Don't go down there, the green stuff all the expression, and across his forehead a large red dash. It came to Lanny's sort of feeling flash, it was red. He raised his head a little and stared at the figure, and a cold chill went over him, and his teeth began to shatter, and his arms popped wide, trying to see him better. He whispered, half under his breath. But maybe that was a mistake, for right away the figure began to fade. Let me cry again, after you fight, right, you have to be longing to get it. Speaking of eternity, it's because the form of danger will never really figure itself over the room. There you go! Good job! Good job! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit him! Hit him again! Hit him again! 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 Yeah, good, 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 good! Wow! Yeah, that was very strong. Like his head. He did not go to sleep again. Well, get on yet, he's gonna kill him. Oh, get out of his way. He tried to argue with himself. But there was no making to make this back in the place. He can't shoot him. That's his, uh, I'll do it. Oh, well. Good job! Which one you want? He said that he and Slept badly didn't want to discuss the matter before Remember that one could put down the electric fence. Remember that one could put down the electric fence. As he had expected, Esther hated the idea. The spice part of 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 the spice Oh, he's got a long arm. Look out. He's gonna burn. He has a knife. Pulse cannon. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay, which one are you gonna try? You gonna heal somebody with a heal mask? Of course. I'll let you say. That's the strongest mask you have. The bigger shield up. For two days, Lanny waited, doing his utmost to keep his mind upon his studies, so as not to forfeit the respect of his stepmother and her friends. Okay. Then again, another came from the media. He badly hurt Green. When the god, the white god. Somehow, he doesn't want to be right on. Good. He was quite sure that Nina was not a religious person. She was looking forward to being a scientist and now it's here. He was sure that he had nothing to do with those dead girls who were themselves like a friend. She was pregnant. She was even moved to keep her for Lanny's help. I asked him for 20. He isn't sure. I yeah, hit that he shield if they if they knock your shield. Okay, that's your, your friend. You don't want to hit on the. Now he's to anybody's help to keep Rick alive. That's right. Of course. Yeah, much as everybody would have entertained. The red ones are the ones who have temporary understanding. But Ryan was humble, and she had to admit that there were more things in heaven to serve than Rick and Ryan. Hey, you are bad. There's something in Rick's soul that he needs to find. Ryan might not say anything. No way. I don't like it. As it happened, prayers for the sick and afflicted were in accordance with the doctor's master's church. So why should not the congregation be requested to break or wound the English office, especially since their own boys were not yet being killed? Oops. Pitsy gotcha. Pitsy, I don't like you. You're going to jail. He arranged for Nina to come into the credit for Cameron to do that for the same way one of the pieces of industry. Being her eye and her husband was in a base hospital abroad, and she could not get to him. They just had to wait to pray. It was some time before she herself knew the story and could write it to Lenny. Take him out. Now don't go in that green stuff. I tried it. I can heal. Fire, fire. Control point. Same combo. Control point. 
unconscious Good job. It's getting better. Hoping that the can face some fighter. This can happen with the yeah, he does, man. Yeah, he's trying to protect me. Good. See, he helped you. He's friend. Now he's healing. But still, the the world had to go on. Lady had to wipe the tears from his eyes. Thank you, see, your, all your points are back. I go, don't hold, don't let off your weapon. You need to let it off so you have bullets when you need them. Get spawn shots, baby. Yep. Good, good, good. Okay, don't go over there. He was making good. He was taking the curse off himself and he was getting education. Okay. Fire, fire. Okay. Slide on it. Something fire. 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 Like that. Here in there, and your and pipe. And the water was on and really for it at six price. He turned to speak and drew so many quarts at a time. And when he had drunk it five days a week for ten years, that was called an ancient history. One year. Medieval history. One year. Out of the line. Geometry one. Elementary French two. Good. And it's French three. And so ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。ロンチャーズベイ。
The secretary assured him that all this had been studied by experts, and the speed of the belt precisely adjusted so that no one would become weary. Yeah. It was a pleasant thing to hear, but Lanny would have been to ask the of course, you have to find a way to cause you to have a lot of the right way to work. And if you have a reason to have a lot of things, you can get them to work. But I must have been persuaded to have it. He was standing in front of the house. 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 He was proud of that large institution which his forefathers had built. See, the he map up there tells you where the enemy is. That, the the cone there is the where the you're moving. Time move. The time to decide was now. For what was the sense of shutting himself up in a room and running the things of old wars if his business was going to be what he was? He seemed to have left to take the next day to make the or he ought to go into the place and show him his father and his overburdened grandfather all about stealing the little and bottles which were being cleared by laboratories. About slow burning and quickly raised hours, and the base of flying was made with some different sorts of people. Okay, you're in the you're in the 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 Good, good, good shot. Good shot. We got it. Yeah, so that's an assist. Whenever it's yellow, it means you and somebody else has it. His heart was burning by all this place of patriotic excitement which possessed the country. The newspapers full of propaganda, the streets blaring music, and four toy armor and men and sales with Iberty bombs. The airplanes were going to be driven by Iberty motors, and you made Iberty stay in the country instead of hamburgers and sour cream. Why do you think such nonsense? But he needs no more to see the country and its resources being used for what he said were the purposes of British imperialism. The senator didn't need for containing either in his work or in his home. As it happened, Ronnie's wife was growing more martial minded every day. She was believing the atrocity stories, including the money to deliver the bombs, which probably did organize the women of Newcastle for the United States, for the Royal Rangers, Mercy, but had her dreams recalled for by patriotic societies and government officials. It happened that President Wilson was the son of a Presbyterian minister, and that Esther's father was the daughter of one. Esther read the president's own words and believed every one of them. When Ronnie would remark that the British ruling classes were the shrewdest of the guests in the world, a sudden chill would fall at the breakfast table. One one. Get an eye. That's not an eye. Man, didn't want his grandfather came for quite a while. He saw him in the church. You have the power to do a shot call. Just got this dollar into the end of his dream and wanted it for that day. Right, so the Zephyr's power is the shot call. Right, so as soon as this uh, winds up again, you can hit the space bar and do a shot call. Space bar. Space bar. Space bar. Space bar. Space Space bar. And said you were a better land, but the child box. Oh, this is a better land. not to be taken too seriously. It's not important to be able to give praise. Lady met others at his uncles and aunts. Sometimes in church, sometimes when they came to the house and stayed in the house. Mommy would tell him about these few things all the time. Because Ronnie's view of his relatives was often touched with mischief. They were a cranky mom. An old family which had to find four generations of fifty-year-olds that were inspired by his family. Some were satisfied to stay in Hardison and make more money, even though they had no need for it. Oh, Arnburn. Oh, Greek and Sophronia, an old maid, lived in an ancient castle with many cats, and when Lanny was called at her request, she took her in the ass with a dust cloak over her hair, sorting out family treasures in an old truck. She had found lots of people who was going to have a good lifespan, and invited Lanny to help her back, which she did, and found him a cousin of her. This old lady had a sense of humor, and told her grandnephew that some years ago she had lost interest in life, and had found to her surprise that this had been quite happy. These odd people had a way of borrowing literally and never making up. But Lanny was responsible for the same household that he was in the other school. Their family farm, so they had cut the pickups and lived as neighbors, but did not visit. And Agatha, Ronnie's eldest sister, who often took up residence in a hotel and forbade the clerk of the house to announce any person by the name of Ronnie. That was New England, Ronnie said. A sort of thing on place, self centered, and proud. I died. One night, I believe it was formal, and it was his uncle Wampa. He took place in church, where 
surviving uncle and grandfather Samuel. He lived in a town of the interior called Norton, and was 83, and still ill. He sent word that he wanted to meet his new kinsman, and since he was the head of the family, his wish was command. Norton was to motor on Saturday morning, and come back on Sunday evening. And Esther told him not merely how to behave, but where on the trip he would see a famous old Virginia house, and an old Bill Winchester's grandfather had built, and a churchyard with a headstone of the book janitor all the parts. The churchyards are among the most interesting places in New England, said my least mother. The main street of the village of Norton was broad, and deeply shaded with great elms. Its residences were white, and none had fences or hedges, but stood in a continuous well-kept lawn, with elms and oaks and maples averting the summer's glare. They were dignified old houses with well-proportioned colonial doorways, and no unseemly noises ever disturbed their peace inside or out. In one of them the old gentleman lived with his second wife, some thirty years younger than himself, and one married daughter there were many such in New England, because so many of the young men went away. The family lived frugally, upon a small income, because this retired preacher valued independence more than anything else in the world. He buds will all tell you how to live if you will let them, he said to Lenny, with a dry smile. He was a man of more than six feet, his frame slender and unbound. His hair was snow white and long, his face seemed shaven, with a long and nose and deeply graven lines around the mouth. His neck was long and the cords stood out on it, and his skin was like withered brown parchment. But his eyes were still keen, yes. and his step though slow was steady. He had learned how to live, and to limit his desires and keep his spirits serene. But he felt as soon as he entered the house that here was a place ruled by love. The great great aunt Bethesda was a Quaker, gentle, quiet, like a little gray dove. She said, as they had a pleasant trip. And this was something new to Lenny, and awake in his curiosity. He knew that the old gentleman was a Unitarian, and that this had been a scandal in his time, and still was to Grandfather Samuel, and perhaps to Stepmother Master. One glance about was enough to tell him that Eli was a scholar, for the walls were lined with books that had been read and lived with. Sitting in his patriarch's study, Lenny was invited to talk about himself, and he was coming to Persons he had met, especially the old ones, such as Anne Anatole Frizz, and Anne, 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 the 17-year-old one told his difficulties and his problems, and the 83-year-old one renewed his mood and spoke words which seemed a sort of divination. Said he, do not let other people invade your personality. Remember that every human being is a unique phenomenon and worth your value. You will meet many who have no use or skill on and who will try to pass themselves upon you. You will find other students to tell you what you really think and feel. But it is better to go apart and learn to go. Go, go, girl! No, she's, she's a friend of ours. something else, he said, that is greater than ourselves. Now, works through us, it can be used in the making of character. The central core of life is personality. To respect the personality of others is the beginning of the And to enforce respect for it is the first duty of the individual toward all forms of government, all organizations and systems which may contrive to enslave and limit their fellows. ID. Dr. Moore. A twilight hall, and again, the freshness of the morning. They sat in a heap of frugal meals which two gentle ladies prepared for them. But most of the girls got to sit down and study and talk. Lenny had never heard anyone whose conversation satisfied him so completely. The girls were on the bus side. The organist knew about him across the seas. Lenny told about his mother and about Marcel. About Rick and his family and about her. He told about Rosemary and the old clergyman was not shocked. Okay, click your mouse. 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 And what suited some did not suit others. He blood of truth is hot. He said, you're about to have a lot. Click your mouse. Click your mouse. Click your mouse. 
Yeah, we have to study Gomer's girl. Let's get this kid out. You don't kick good players out of the game, that's what we want. He acquired knowledge and weight and measured portions. Memorized facts and recited them. Forgot many of them until the end of the month. You learned them for us. You gotta, you gotta learn how to lose. You learned them once more for us. And you forgot them forever and ever. Amen. In addition to this part of his life, scheduled and ordained by the school authorities, the horn had its own life which it lived during off hours. This life centered upon three things, athletic prowess, class politics, and sex. If you can run, you play football or baseball, your success was probable. If you can talk realistically about girls, it would help. What a mega mom! What the hell? And if you had any more sexy features, good clothes, and easy manners, all problems were solved. Each week of third year, when he was jumping into the midst of school holidays, and had to get looked over and judged quickly. His cousin, belonging to a fashionable set, was ready to initiate him, and would be provoked if Lan didn't display proper respect for the fine place upon which his friends based their judgments. Be careful, or they'll set you down for a wear, said this mentor. Mommy had asked Lanny not to play football, a sack of was too late to go for this rough game. It was another of those cases in which the father expected him to be wiser than himself. Mommy didn't want Lanny to smoke or drink. He was going for him to have a girl now and then. Got a fat to shoot him. He was planning to test drive by the bus and his stepmother's church having no one else to do Good, you got it. Shot pulse. And much of it was a good test for the baseball. So he's never been entirely aware. Let's go. But he had many handicaps to success in St. Thomas's. He had just come from abroad, and that made him an object of curiosity. He pronounced French correctly, which could only be taken as an application. He had read a great many books. He did not just discover this one, and brought it out in class, only to work in the desire for a culture to use on barbarians all at play. That was part of my mind. His first discovery was a talent discovery that I sent him to St. Thomas's and rather done. Let it rip. 
more than a year ago, and told his son about secret treaties of the Allies, in which they had distributed the spoils yeah, you of war among themselves. Yeah, you can heal yourself. Now these treaties were published in the New York Evening Post, and this chair has been brought into Lenin in the form of a pamphlet. So, despite his cousin's wounds, Lenin became more clear, and this was in due course you reported back to the female. You can lose. Also you can lose. 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 If you disregarded the warning, attention would be called more sternly, and if a third warning had no effect, you might be lesser. Among the masters at St. Thomas's was one top English, a slender and ascetic young man who was trying to find both of these hot Good! My husband has discovered a plan to get more than one of the good plans to visit that country. They talked about it in the press, and from this developed a legend, and when he was invited to the masters, that was the guy that killed you last time. This was a form of clearance for which the war had never before had to deal, and they didn't know quite what to make of it. They applied to it in rather awful terms, and they're very disordered slain. He said that I was not enough to sell the food. Mr. Allen got involved with about only eight hundred dollars a year for his rent and labors to the school. He had eight hundred dollars to take care of. Oh, mega mom! He was mad at me. Like, though this was probably not intentional. He was mad. Both of ourselves. Later came a letter saying someone could not count upon the cable these days. He had a lovely little baby girl and had named her Marcella. The finger was exceedingly proud of himself. I get him. Get him. Oh, good. Good job. 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 Somebody's getting very close to you if you look at the They're very still hoping to get rid of pain and what was left of his knee. They were living at the reaches. Sir Al was up there for work and running around the places most of the time. He was fine. 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 The government of Kerensky, trying to go on with the war, had been overthrown by a group called Bolsheviks, a Russian word which nobody had ever heard before. These were out and out revolutionists, confiscating all property and socializing industry. Robbie said this overturn was the most terrible blow the Allies had yet received. It meant that Germany had won half the war, and the job oh, of the United States terrible. had been doubled. T may mean even more than that. He added, Don't break the bombs. Those of hatred and destruction exist everywhere, and they're bound to try the same thing in other countries. Oh, you suppose there are Bolsheviks in this country, Robbie? Thousands of them. They're not all Russians, either. Your uncle Jesse Michaels is some such crackpot. That's why I was determined he shouldn't get hold of He's an actor. He used to be, and this may start up again. He may be behind these new ears have happening in the French army. Oh, that's crazy, Robbie. Don't they know the Germans have marched straight and take the country? Suppose they figure that the same sort of agitation is going on among the German troops. If that fire once got to blazing, it might spread everywhere. Osh. Do you suppose we have such people in buds? After all, they keep pretty quiet. Father and mother have ways to keep track of agitators. How do you can expect to run the industry unless he knows what's going on in it? This thing in Russia has set all the agitators crazy. Long thought for a moment, then added, those secret treaties of the Allies have put a powerful weapon into their hands. They say to the workers, look what you're fighting for. Look what's being done to you. But you said it too, Robbie. No. But it's one thing for you and me to know such facts, and another for them to be in the hands of revolutionists and criminals. Here's a chap who still has a copy of those treaties and talks about them a lot. He says everything that you do. Catch up with him. Of course, Lenny ought to have known better than to ask questions of such a man. 
the man tried to avoid answering them, saying that he didn't wish to give offense to a member of the Bug family. But that was a challenge to Lenny's integrity. He had to declare that he couldn't possibly be offended by the truth. So Mr. Snapper said, all right, if he asked for it, he could have it. The other members of the company gathered round to hear what this adequate young minister might have to say to his son and the Air Bug gunmakers. What Mr. Snapper said was that Bugs didn't allow the workers to organize. They had refused to let the strikers speak on the streets and had suppressed their papers. They had had the town council pass a law forbidding the distribution of handbills. Later on they had shut down the strike headquarters and had the leaders arrested on various charges. They had brought in an army of guards, whom they had taken to the sheriffs, and provided with arms and ammunition made by the bug workers for their own union. So the strike had been broken, and now no one could talk union in any bug plant. Workers who breathed the word of it were instantly fired. Could all that be true? Asked Lanny. And the Reverend Mr. Snappers replied that everybody in Newcastle knew that it was true. The businessman justified it by saying that it was necessary to keep the workers from being led into violence. That that means, said the minister, as that large-scale private industry will destroy what we in America call political democracy, and our liberties are doomed. It seems to me that is something about which American citizens ought to be making up their minds. Lenny could only thank Mr. Snappers for speaking frankly, and saying that he had lived abroad, and hadn't even heard about the strike, which had taken place in the summer of 1913, and was at Hallowell. Strange to think of such things going on at the very time that he was learning to enact the law of one of the Lux Furies. Such a graceful and charming theory he had been them taking it for granted that tragic and cruel things happen only in operas and films, and that you would do your duty to men when you learn to enact them beautifully. Lenny didn't tell Mr. Smathers how his father had admitted whom they was maintained a spy system. Nor did he say what he knew about his uncle Lawford, who had had a handling of that strike. A somber person was this vice president in charge of production. Both he and the president of the company would know that whatever they did to protect Bud's and its profits was the will of the Almighty, and that Reverend Postman was an agent of Satan or perhaps of Lenin and Trotsky, two personal devils who had suddenly leaped onto the front pages of American newspapers. I asked. Of course those who had been present that evening went out and talked about it. From the point of view of the hostess it had been a great success. People would think that the them where such dramatic incidents took place. The reports spread in ever widening the circles, and did not follow the laws which govern sound and water waves, but grew louder and bigger as they traveled. So came a new experience for the new people of St. Thomas's Academy. One morning he was called from class to the office of the headmaster, M.R. Scott. This gentleman was tall and gray-haired, firm but kind in manner. With him were two severe-looking gentlemen whose clothes made them known as persons of importance. One was large and heavy, with scanty hair, and was introduced as Mr. Tomgow. Lenny learned afterwards that he was an important anchor from the state capitol, chairman of the board of trustees of the school. The other was a young businessman of the keen, go-getter type, an official in one of the big insurance companies. Mr. Pettyman was his name, and he also was a trustee. Lenny was quickly made aware that this was a great occasion. They had come, said the headmaster, to make inquiries about Mr. Baldwin, concerning whom certain reports were being circulated they wished Lenny to tell them all he knew about this master. The request brought the blood of Lenny's cheeks. R. Baldwin is a gentleman of the very highest type, he said, quickly. He has been most kind to me, and has given me a great deal of help. I'm pleased to hear you say that, replied the headmaster. Is there anything you could report that would do him harm? I'm quite sure there is not, sir. And I know you will be glad to answer any questions these gentlemen may ask you. Lenny wasn't exactly glad, but he realized at once that if he hesitated, or seemed to be lacking in frankness, it would be taken as counting against his friend. Mr. Tarbell, the banker, spoke in a slow and heavy voice. It is being reported that Mr. Baldwin has talked in a way to indicate that he is out of sympathy with the war. Has he said anything of the sort to you? Oh, you mean privately, or in class? You either. In class I have never heard him mention the war. Privately he has sometimes agreed with things I have said to him. That have you said to him? I said it's a war for profits, and that for this reason I find it hard to give it any support. That is the thing you have for saying that it's a war for profits? I've seen the evidence, sir. Indeed. Who has shown it to you? My father, for one. The banker from Hartford appeared taken aback. Our father has said that in so many words. He has said it a hundred times. He wrote it to me continually while I was living in France. He warned me on no account to let myself forget that it's a war to protect the French and British interests, and that many of them are treating the enemy, and protecting their own properties to the injury of their country. Okay. Said Mr. Tarbell. Words seem to have failed me. Envy of this war, persisted Lanny, and Herod admitted as much in my presence. Oh, is Herod? It was Lanny's turn to be surprised. Herod is the richest man in the world, sir. Indeed. Is he richer than Rockefeller? He controls most of the armament plants of Europe, and my father says this war has made him the richest man in the world. Now he is keen for the war to continue a sweep out, he said. My father had a letter from Lord Riddle the other day, saying that was Herod's praise. Envy this man admits that his motive is profits. Ah, in those words, sir, but it was the clear sense of many things he said. We know him personally, and we was in his home in Paris last March, with my father, and they talked about the war a great deal, as businessmen and makers of munitions. Text. The banker dropped the embarrassing subject of the war for profits. He said it had been reported that Mr. Baldwin had attended a social gathering in Sam Hill, at which time he had been a great deal of open talk by a notorious preacher named Snatters. Had Lanny been there? Lanny said he had been at Mrs. Ricardi's, if that was the place that was meant. He had heard no such talk. He had come away thinking that the Reverend Mr. Snatters was a saint, which was something different from the Bolshevik, as he understood it. But didn't he criticize by gunmakers for the and its conduct of the swine? He told what had happened, but only after I had asked him to. Oh, you accept what he told you? 
have in mind to ask my father about it, but I haven't seen him since that time. Did Mr. Baldwin take any part in that conversation? I don't recall that he did. I think he was on, like most of the others. Andy, did he say anything to you about it afterwards? Oh, sir. He was probably afraid of embarrassing me. Did you know that Mr. Snappers was to be there? I have no idea about that, sir. I was invited by Mrs. Ricardi, and I didn't know who else was coming. Here were other pupils of St. Thomas's present. Yes, sir. Who were they? Lenny hesitated. You'd rather not say anything about my fellow pupils, sir. I have said that I will tell you about Mr. Baldwin. The young go-getter, Mr. Pettyman, took up the question. He wanted to know about the master's ideas, and what was the basis of Lenny's intimacy. Lenny replied that Mr. Baldwin was a lover of poetry, and had written some fine verses, and had given them to Lenny to read. He had lent him books. Wood books. Lenny named a volume of Satyana. It was a foreign-sounding name, and evidently Mr. Pettyman had heard of it, so Lenny mentioned that the writer had been a professor of philosophy at Harvard. In a kind of fatherly way, the banker reminded the impetuous lad that the nation was at war. Your boys are going overseas to die in a cause which may not be perfect, but how often do you need absolute perfection in this world? There has never been a war in which some persons didn't profit at the expense of the government. The same thing happened in the Civil War, but that didn't keep it from being a war to preserve the Union. No, said Lenny. My father has told me about that also. He says that was how J.P. Morgan made the start of his me by selling him damn rifles to the Union government. So ended the question of Lenny Bud. He didn't realize what an awful thing he had said until later, when he told his father about it, and Robin manifested surprise mixed with amusement. Mr. Tarbell's great bank was known as the Morgan Bank, and the house of Morgan was just then the apex of dignity and power in the financial world it was handling the purchases of the Allied governments, expending about $3,000 million of their money in the United States. 22. Above the battle. I. Lenny came home for Christmas. The war was not allowed to interfere with this festival. A big tree was set up in the home, and the elaborate decorations were hung. Everybody spent a lot of time thinking what presents to give to relatives who obviously didn't need anything. Lenny, a stranger, saw the advice of her stepmother, and they went to the town's largest bookstore and tried to guess what sort of book each person might care for. By this method, the well-to-do got reading matter enough to occupy their time for the rest of the year. Lenny remembered his Christmas at Schloss Stubendor, where people ate enormously, but were frugal in other spending. Here in New England, it was the other way around it wasn't quite good for him just up your stomach, but Jinky ingenuity had been expended in devising toys to please the children of the rich, and the dogs were swamped under a flood of goods incredibly perfect in workmanship. On Christmas morning, the base of the tree was piled with packages wrapped in multicolored paper and tied with ribbons. Pipes and cigars, bedroom slippers, silk dressing gowns, neck these were standard for the men while ladies received jewels, wristwatches, silk stockings, veils and scarves, handbags and vanity cases, elaborately decorated boxes of chocolates and candy from the Severio had such quantity of these things that it was rather a bore opening parcels, and you could read in their faces the thought, how on earth am I going to do with all this? Robert Jr. and Percy were two friendly and quite normal boys, living rather depressed lives at home. Esther considered all forms of extravagance as bad taste, and tried to teach this to her children. But she was fighting the current of her time, in which everything grew more elaborate and expensive, and a vast propaganda for spending was maintained by thousands of interested agencies. Here came this flood of goods, bearing the cars of uncles and aunts and cousins and school friends and even employees. The boys became surfeited, they couldn't really appreciate anything. Lenny had to share of goods in a bewilderment. The cameras, three sweaters they already had several in his clothes closet. More neckties, more handkerchiefs, more hair brushes. An alligator skin belt that was too heavy for comfort. Newly published books that some clerk in a store had said would appeal to a youth. And in the midst of all that superfluity, a gift from great great uncle a line of much worn copy of the Rose Walden, appearing as misplaced as its author would have been in this fashionable company. Henry David Thoreau, telling you how to live in a hut on a diet of cornmeal mush and beans, in order to have your spirit re entertain not in to commercialism. Old New England and the New England met in the Bud family drawing room, and neither was much interested in the other. I I. Lenny had sent his great great uncle the handsomest book he could find in the local store, a he looks copy of Don Quixote with the door illustrations. There came now an invitation to spend a weekend with the old gentleman, and to bring us along. Esther wasn't entirely pleased by the intimacy between her daughter and her stepson, but Lenny promised to drive very, very carefully on the snow-covered roads, and Bess was so thrilled and Robbie so pleased that the mother couldn't forbid the visit. Between Lenny and his stepmother lay a temperamental gulf that nothing could ever bridge. Lenny was guided by his love of beauty, whereas Esther had to think carefully about everything she felt or did, and bring it into conformity with rigid standards. A few times in the afternoon she had come in to find her stepson playing the piano in a loudly extravagant manner, completely absorbed in it. Esther had stood and listened, uneasy in her mind. She had never heard such music, at least not in the drawing room, and to her it was disorderly and unwholesome. Impossible to believe that anyone could let himself go like that and not sooner or later misbehave in other ways. As for her, it sounded like he had something of the Robin Turner to her mother. And now came this heat from abroad to stimulate that tendency. Bess would listen to his playing with a rapt expression, as if transported to some strange land where her mother had never been. Bess wanted to play like Lenny. She wanted to dance like Pine and wear a one-piece bathing suit in the drawing room while doing it. She chattered about the places her romantic brother had visited, the people he had met, the sights he had seen, the stories he told her. Books on child training which Esther conscientiously read all agreed that you shouldn't be saying oh Don't envy so Esther didn't. But uneasiness troubled her mind. On that lovely winter ride, snugly wrapped in her robes, Lenny told the child about the wonderful old gentleman she was going to meet. Great great uncle Eli had once helped slaves to escape. His friend Thoreau had gone to jail for refusing to pay taxes to the slave catching government, and when Paul Emerson had come to ask, Henry, what are you doing here? Henry had answered, I'll go. 
What are you doing out of here? Some of them had gone to live in a colony called Brook Farm, in order to be independent and have more wholesome lives. That is a colony? Demanded Bess. And then, H, what fun? Are there any colonies now? These two reincarnations of the New idealism arrived in the village of Morton and the Father Moon to appreciate their favorite lives. This was the father of the wife and the sex of the daughter made them unhealthy, and has sat for hours at the old man's feet. She couldn't understand all his long words, but she knew that what he said was true. When the two young people drove home again they had this new bond between them, as if something she thought that had anointed them with holy oil. I am happy. The last picture of the world was the darkest and most dreadful. For three years and a half all the ingenuities of man and resources of science had been devoted to the ends of destruction. Both sides now had many kinds of poison gases, some which penetrated the clothing and tormented the skin, some which destroyed the lungs, some which blinded men, or made them vomit unceasingly. These gases were put into shells, and whole battlefronts were drenched with them. The Germans had flamethrowers, which killed the men who used them as well as those in front. The British and French had tanks, it willows and it'll willows, which advanced in front of the troops, spitting fire and death. The court's vision had come to reality, and there rained a ghastly dew from the nation's very navies grappling in the central blue. Squadrons of swift fighting craft darted here and there. They swooped from the clouds and machine gunned the marching troops. They raided behind the lines and dropped bombs upon railroads and ammunition dumps. The sets were fought with explosive bullets, and so great was the peril that the crews of two vessels destroyed them at home in order to avoid going out in them. Everything had become bigger and more deadly than ever before. The Germans constructed enormous siege guns, known as Zigbergers, and set them up in a forest behind Leon, and were firing shells into Paris from a distance of 75 miles. At first people had refused to believe such a thing possible. But now they were being fired every 20 minutes, and on Good Friday one of the shells struck a church and killed and wounded nearly 200 persons, many of them women and children. For the U-boats there were death bombs, and nets across all the principal harbors and channels. The Americans were furnishing 70,000 mines, which would be laid in a chain across the northern entrance to the North Sea, from the Orkney Islands to the coast of Norway, a distance of nearly 300 miles. That made one for every 20 feet. Also the British had devised the boats LD trap steamers with concealed armor sent out to wander in the danger zones. A submarine would rise and open fire with shells but they tried to save the torpedoes for bigger craft. Some of the men of the boat, the Anna crew, would take to the boats. The up would come closer to the fleet or Joe and suddenly portions of the steamer sides would drop down, disclosing six-inch guns which would open deadly fire. America was getting ready, but on a scale with a speed never before known in history. You could feel the spirit of the country hardening in the face of worldwide danger. People talked about the war to the exclusion of everything else. Even at St. Thomas's, even at the All Sessions, the fellows discussed what was going on, and what part they hoped to have in it. The draft age was 21, but you could volunteer younger, and now and then some upper-class man would pack up his belongings and move to an officer's training camp. Lenny was now 18, and his father worried over the possibility that his emotional temperament might take fire. Whenever the youth came home over Sunday, Robbie would sound him out to see if the bacterial propaganda had found lodgment in his mind. If so, he would be subjected to a swift prophylaxis. Did you ever hear of Lord Palmerston? The father would inquire. He was Prime Minister of England during our civil war, and he said, NGLA Indy has no enduring friendships. She only has enduring interests. Robbie and Esther didn't agree about England, or about America either, and Robbie's rule was to let her say anything she pleased, uncontradicted. He did the same thing with his friends. Of course they all knew that he had special opportunities to get information, and their curiosity was aroused, but all he would say was that he made weapons to those who wanted to find him have the cash. Now and then old Samuel would caution his son, enter business and let bulls shoot off their mouths. No one ever found out what the president of Bud Gunmakers thought about this war. All they knew was that he made munitions 24 hours every day, including the Lords. As a result of all this land he wasn't entirely happy through the war period. People weren't satisfied to let you think your own thoughts. They considered it their duty to probe you, to cross-examine you, and if you were wrong to try to set you right. At school the fellows decided that Lamy was lacking in appreciation of the land where his fathers died. His fashionable cousin told him so, and they agreed to have the good the following year. At the same time Lamy was deprived of the companionship of Mr. Baldwin, for the unless he had advised to confine his teaching to the subject of literature, and to avoid contacts with his pupils outside the classroom. I.D. There came a letter which gave Lamy an extraordinary thrill. The envelope was addressed by typewriter, with no sender's name, but with a United States stamp and a New York postmark. Inside was a long missive from Kurt Meissner. At first Lamy wondered, had Kurt come to New York? But then he realized that his friend must have known somebody in a neutral country who was coming. Anyhow, here was a real letter, the first land he had had from Germany since the outbreak of the war. Kurt gave the news about himself and his family. He was a captain of artillery, and had been twice wounded, once with a bullet through the thigh, and the second time having pieces of goods torn out by a shell fragment. He was not at liberty to give the name of his unit or where it was stationed. Only that he was writing from a villa in a town behind the front, while having a few days recuperation. All three of his brothers had been in the war. One had been killed during the early invasion of East Prussia, and another was now at home recovering from a wound. Kurt's father had an important government post. His sister had married an officer, and was a widow with two babies. Kurt told about the state of his soul, which was uncomplicated, and oddly like that of Marcel in the book. The country was at war, and it was necessary for man to put aside everything else, and to help overcome the arrogance and treacherous foe. Kurt said he was as much interested in musical philosophy as ever, but his duties as an artillery officer left him little time to think about these subjects. After the fatherland had emerged victorious, as surely he must and would, he would hope to hear that his American friend had been able to go on with his studies. 
This led to the main purpose of the letter, which was to pay the planning to resist the subtle wiles of the British propaganda machine. Kurt was afraid that his friend might get physically hurt, for it was obvious that the British would be driven into the sea and the French would lose Paris long before the Americans could take any effective part in this war. But Kurt didn't want his friend's mind distorted and warped by the agents of British imperialism. These people, who had grabbed most of the desirable parts of the Earth, now thought they had a chance to destroy the German fleet, build their cape to cut railroad, keep the Germans from building the Linda Bagdad Railroad, and every way for the efforts of a vigorously capable race to find their place in the sun. It was to be expected the French would hate Germany and make war upon her, because the French are a jealous people, and thought of Germans as their hereditary enemies. They were pursuing their feudal dream of getting Alsace Lorraine with its treasures of coal and iron. But Englishmen were blood kinsmen to the Germans, and their war upon Germany was fratricide. The claim of using black and gun would be able to destroy the highest culture in Europe without all its perpetrators forever. Now the desperate British militarists were spending their wealth circulating a mess of lies about Germany's war methods and war aims. What a tragedy that Americans, a free people, with 3,000 miles of ocean between them and Europe's borders, had swallowed all this money together, and were wasting their money and their labor helping Britain to grab more territory and harness more people's dirt imperial chariot. Levy took that letter to his father, and they read it together, and Robbie pointed out how its arguments resembled those which you could read every day in the past of the other time before everything turned around. He saw his own side, and was blind to the other fellows. Who like Kurt and tell him that you were going on with your studies, said the father. And added, raise it carefully, because you can't tell who may read a letter nowadays. V. Now and then Landry would write to his mother, reciting his adventures in the land of the Pilgrim's tribe, all the strange kinds of people he was meeting, and how different it was from Pilgrim's. Knowing how Peter was interested in human beings, he went into detail about his stepmother, a good woman, but so inhibited had a word Landry had learned from the conversation of Sophie, Baroness de Montserrat, who was very different from Esther Benson Butt, and would have done a scandal if she had ever come to Newcastle. Landry left no doubt that he preferred one as a home, when he was doing his job here as his father wished. Beauty wrote once or twice a month, nice gossipy letters. Baby Marslan was thriving upon her natural diet, and Beauty herself was well, and as happy as one could expect to be in these sad days. More and more widows on the streets, more and more needless for Emily Chattersworth to crowd into her place. Prices were rising, and fear was universal Beauty said she couldn't write all the alarming things that were reported. Everywhere in American, when he heard one question, and are your soldiers coming? The Germans were preparing an enormous offensive by which they hoped to end the war. And poor France had scraped the bottom of the national pot for manpower. There just weren't any more young men, hardly any middle-aged ones. You didn't see them on the streets, you didn't see them in the fields. H. Lenny, I am praying to God it may be over before you go up. Marcel would send a message, or skip along or two on the bottom of the page. Marcel didn't discuss the war, or his own problems. He would say something about the state of Lanny's soul, remember you are an artist, and don't let the Puritans strike me. He would say, I'm hating a chef parting from his mother. It looks like this envy he would give a little pencil sketch. He would say, I am the chest he is worried, and make a comic drawing of the figure most hated in France. Lenny treasured these sketches, and showed them to his father, but not to anyone else. His stepmother would of course disapprove of his having a stepfather. If Lenny's mother had been a woman with a sense of propriety, she would have expiated her sin by living a celibate life. But Beauty had been born without that sense. Beauty had a husband of a sword, and was making the most of him. She talked about his work upon every occasion, part for it, and intrigued to get it shown in Ricardo's a custom in France, and possibly not unknown in other lands. When some critic called Marcel to as a painter with a future, Beauty purchased all the copies of that paper she could find, and found the article and sent it to her friends. Marcel still didn't care for being promoted, but his wife had won the right to do what she could. Her main struggle was to keep him from going back into the army. She would say, over and over, the Americans are coming, Marcel. They are making a real army. They need to finish it. She would find things in the British and American papers and magazines and bring them to him. She wrote to Robbie, asking him to tell her what was going on, in such a way that Marcel would be convinced, and so he went to stay at home and read the saving of French to men who didn't happen to be geniuses. He I. The new masters of Russia, the Bolsheviks, made peace with the Germans in Brest like Tomsk, an action regarded as treason by almost everybody in the Allied lands. It set the Germans free and east, and enabled them for the first time to have an actual superiority of numbers on the Western Front. Their long prepared offensive was launched in the middle of March. First against the British on the Somme, a front of nearly 50 miles. They brought up masses of artillery, and mountains of smoke shells and gas shells. They overwhelmed the British and drove them back with a loss of some 300,000 men. They attacked again farther north, and pushed the weakened British lines almost to the sea. Then they fell upon the French, and drove them again to the river Marne, close to Paris, as in the early days of the war. This desperate fighting lasted for about three months, and all that while the French people lived in an agony of suspense, waiting hour by hour for news of the collapse which seemed inevitable. Frenchmen and Britons were dying by hundreds every hour, sometimes by thousands. And hopes were dying even faster more than those at war, tormented beauty. The first news came to Lanny by mail. No use to people, since there was nothing to be done. Parcel has gone, good mother. He stole away at night, leaving a letter on my pillow. I made it too hard for him, I suppose. He couldn't face any more scenes. Do not worry about me, I have got myself together. I've been living this over and over for the past two years, and never really believed I could escape it. Now I don't torment myself with hope. Now I know I shall never see him again. They will take him into the army, and he will die fighting. I have to reconcile myself to the fact that one cannot have happiness in these times. Of course I have little Mars line, the letter went on. That is why she was brought into the world, because in my secret heart I knew what was coming. I am still nursing her, but have been going over to Seth C.H. every afternoon. 
There are such pitiful cases. I don't know what to think about the war, or what to expect. It seems impossible that the Germans can ever be driven out of France. Shall I have to watch the spectacle of American boys pouring over and being sacrificed for nothing? Have I got to live to see my only son drawn into it? Am I going to hear the same phrases from you that I listened to from Marcel's lips? While Landy was reading that letter, he knew that Marcel must be in the thick of the fighting. He was a trained man, and the fact that part of his face was gone wouldn't count in a time like this. They would give him a uniform and a gun, assign him to a regiment, and put him into one of the canyons that were being rushed to the front. And so it turned out. Marcel wrote letters to his wife, full of quiet certainty and peace. He was doing the thing that he had to do, that he was made to do. He wrote about the sights that had seen in Paris. About the man in his outfit, some too old and some too young, some veterans just out of hospital. He wasn't allowed to tell where he was going, but presently he was there, and the march was in front of him, and still advancing, and had to be stopped. And that was the end. There came no more letters. The enemy advanced, and was not stopped at least not yet. Of course there remained the possibility that Marcel might have been taken prisoner. His friends had to wait until the war was over, and then wait some more. But they never heard from him. Later on Lanny made inquiries, and learned that Marcel's company had been defending one of those trenches which had been turned into shell holes. Presumably he had stayed there, firing his rifle as long as he could hold it and see the enemy. He had been buried in an unmarked grave, along with many of his comrades. His dust would enrich the soil of La Patrie, and his soul would inspire new generations of Frenchmen with a love of beauty, and with pity for the blunders and sorrows of mankind. P.I.I. Lanny came home for a weekend, and found a surprise letter. He had failed to let Jerry Pendleton know he was in the United States, so the letter had crossed the ocean and come back. His old tutor had been picked in one of the early drafts and trained in Camp Funston. Now he was a sergeant, a machine gun expert giving special training to a group in Camp Deuce and expecting soon to move on, to a destination not supposed to be mentioned in soldiers' letters. But Jerry said, and going to see Cerise if I have to bust a guy which wasn't exactly keeping military secrets. Lenny was greatly excited, for he had heard a lot about Camp Deuce. It was where some of his classmates had gone, and others were planning to go at the end of the term. It was in Massachusetts, some three hours' drive from Newcastle. H, Robbie, can I go and see him? Right away, before he sails. End a wire and find out if he's still there, said the father. Lenny did so, and the reply came in a jiffy, the light of advice coming quickly visitors one to five in a day. Jerry, economical fellow, had not in his exact ten words. Lenny was all in a fuss. He must go the next day, which was Sunday. Would Robbie go with him? Jerry Pendleton was a grand chap, and perhaps was using the bug gun, and might be able to tell Robbie things. The father said, all right, they'd make an excursion of it.